unanimous consent. It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. The Premier continues to defend paying Hydro One CEO $4 million. She is now defending this gold-plated paycheck by comparing it to corporate America. The Premier can't find a single hydro company anywhere in Canada that would pay a similar salary. Mr. Speaker, will the Acting Premier give us one comparable in Canada to justify this outrageous salary? Thank you. Speaker, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, uh, is here and asking questions, but I sure do wish he would ask a question about the infrastructure that will be built with the revenue generated from broadening the ownership of Hydro One. The, on the, the truth is, Speaker, the party opposite has absolutely— Order, please. I seek to hear both question and then answer. Finish, please. He isn't asking about building infrastructure. He isn't asking about building hospitals. He isn't asking about expanding natural gas across the province. He isn't asking about connecting links. Speaker, on this side. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. And if the shouting continues, I'll move right to warnings. Carry on. On this side of the House, we have a plan to build the infrastructure that this province needs. On that side of the House, they're great at criticizing, but they have no plan Answer. to build the infrastructure that they actually are lobbying for. Thank day. you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, there is no new infrastructure money. Your plan is the same pre- and post-hydro fire sale. So let me ask you the question again. Can you give me one comparable, one comparable anywhere in Canada? You won't find it in BC, as their top three exec salaries combined to make just half that of the Hydro One CEO. You can't look next door to Quebec because their CEO makes one eighth of the Hydro One CEO salary in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, how did this government sign off on this paycheck? Give me one justification how you think a four million dollar salary is appropriate. No more spin, no more distraction. It's not about infrastructure justify the salary deputy premier uh, speaker part of our plan is to make sure that hydro one becomes a better company a stronger company a more efficient company speaker stronger management committed to improved customer service improved performance speaker and taxpayers will continue to benefit from the changes that we are making as the 40 percent share that we will continue to hold will generate revenue to the public speaker. We have struck the right balance. The compensation, line, uh, compensation is in line with other energy companies, speaker. But this is about better customer service, and I know, I know that your caucus hears the same stories about how Hydro One should be and could be a much stronger company. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, you, you say it's comparable to other energy CEOs, but you won't mention a single example. People in Ontario are living in energy poverty. You know, tonight, a senior citizen in rural Ontario will have to choose between having a healthy meal for dinner or turning on the heat to keep their house warm. And at the same time, this government continues to turn their back on these seniors, the Premier has somehow found the money to pay their Hydro One CEO four million dollars. Mr. Speaker, how can this government look in the eyes of seniors in rural Ontario who can't pay their energy bills and justify the salary? Thank you. Well, uh, Speaker, uh, the, the member opposite, uh, I think, knows or certainly should know that uh, we have significant support for low-income Ontarians to help deal with their energy bill. The examples that the Leader of the Opposition continues to use are examples of people who, have, who are, will be the beneficiaries of the programs for families. The Ontario Electricity Support Program speaker is a new program. I hope he is urging his constituents to enroll in the Ontario Electricity Support Program. It will save them uh, an additional $360 a year off their bill. 
or $430 when combined with the removal of the debt retirement charge. Speaker. We are focused on the needs, the energy needs of low-income Ontarians, and I hope the members opposite are informing their constituents Answer. about the relief that is available to them. Thank you. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. The government is well aware that there are over 200,000 senior citizens living with Alzheimer's disease in Ontario, and the current strategy for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias on the government webpage is just four bullet points with no real action or plan. For example, the second bullet point says invest in long-term care homes, and clearly that isn't happening. Actually, only six facilities in the province have units for seniors who need behavioral support because of Alzheimer's disease. The wait lists are getting longer and longer. Mr. Speaker, can the government tell us when we will see a plan and action on Alzheimer's? Thank you. Deputy uh, the Associate Minister of Health. Associate Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to begin by saying that the province already has uh, we've already embarked on a province-wide strategy to look at dementia. An expert panel has already been called, and it's, it's making its way through and doing its consultations under the leadership of Parliamentary Assistant Indira Naidu Harris. In the meantime, I'd like to remind the member opposite and the leader of the opposition, in fact, I'm happy to invite him to, uh, to showcase the number of investments we have been making in long-term care homes across this province. Very recently, I was in Waterloo for the opening of a brand new facility, which was also attended by members of his caucus. Before that, I was in Windsor, again for the opening of a brand new long-term care facility. We're talking about close to 500 beds in the last Answer. few months that I have witnessed opening. Thank Great you, Mr. Stuff. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the acting premier, and I would invite the minister to actually speak to the families who don't have the care for a loved one. In 1999, a PC government introduced Ontario's Alzheimer's strategy. It was the first of its kind in Canada, and it was a strategy that wasn't renewed by the Liberal government in 2004. It was a strategy that was actually commended and highlighted in the 2010 Rising Tide Report by the Alzheimer's Society. According to last week's coroner's report, the Deputy majority House of Leader. residents in long-term care homes have dementia. If that doesn't spark action from this government, they must have no heart. The government has the responsibility to help these families. Mr. Speaker, will the government provide the House with a commitment that they'll have more than simply four bullet points to dealing with Alzheimer's? They'll, they'll deliver to the House, they'll deliver to Ontario a real strategy to dealing with Alzheimer's. Question. Thank you. Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the Minister of Health would also have a lot that he would like to add, but as I've already said, Mr. Speaker, we have embarked on a province-wide strategy to look at dementia for the entire province, not just in long-term care homes, but at the continuum of care, because we know that people who have dementia don't just live in long-term care homes, they also live in the community. And so what we have done is come out with a, a proposal that broadly looks at dementia and Alzheimer's, not just Ontario, not just Canada. Canada, but across the world, because we have an aging population, yes, the incidence of Alzheimer's and dementia is increasing. We have recognized that, and we have already put in place an expert plan and panel that is crafting a province-wide strategy. Let's just wait for that. Thank here, you. Here. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, you know, enough expert panels, enough talk. You've had 12 years. The, 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 re the report, the last report, expired over a decade ago. You know, I was at the Alzheimer's Gala last week, and people were telling me their stories, their concerns about how their loved ones don't have care. You know, I can relate personally. I saw my grandmother pass away, my maternal grandmother pass away of Alzheimer's disease, and I, and I lived with her. I saw it. It's painful. So I'm asking the government to be serious about this. You know. Listen to the former MPP, your Liberal MPP, Donna Cansfield, who tried three times to convince the legislature to act, and all she said after the failed attempts to get this government to act, she said, you've got an ethical and moral case that tells you you have to do something, you should do something. So I asked the minister, will you do something? No talking points. Will you actually act? Question. Make Ontario a leader. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Deputy Minister. Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Health also has something to add, so I'm going to refer the question to him. Oh, thank you. Minister thank of you, Health, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I know it's the job of the official opposition to paint a picture of inaction, but the truth is we're providing that leadership. We're providing the funding to our important community partners, $18 million last year to the Alzheimer's Society. We're working nationally as well. I was at the federal, provincial and territorial meeting just uh, last fall where we made a decision to develop a national strategy for Alzheimer's. I think the member opposite would agree that that's important, that we have that continuity and consistency and leadership right across the country. We're developing with the good, uh, the hard work of my parliamentary assistant, the member from Halton. We're updating our strategy for Alzheimer's and for dementias across the board in this province. We're consulting with, with stakeholders. But, Mr. Speaker, we've invested more than a billion dollars in, since 2011 uh, in our aging at home strategy, actually over the last four years, Mr. Speaker, and $59 million dollars alone for behavioral Thank supports in our long Thank you. New question? The leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Uh, the temperature is dropping, and there are families across Ontario who rely on electricity to heat their homes. For families who rely on baseboard heating to keep warm this time of year, whether that's a house in Thunder Bay, Speaker, or a, an apartment here in Toronto, higher rates will have a devastating impact on their ability to make ends meet. Since the Premier decided to sell off Hydro One, prices continue to go up. Speaker. Will the Acting Premier, on behalf of this Liberal government, promise Ontarians that selling off Hydro One won't mean skyrocketing hydro bills for people who need to heat their homes this winter. Thank you. Deputy, Deputy uh, thank you, thank you, Speaker. And uh, you know, the member opposite has raised the issue that we have been very concerned about too, and that is the issue of uh, of hydro prices. That's why we have taken action, and I have to say, supported by neither of the opposition parties, to lower the burden on people, and particularly those with the lowest income. So let's look at what we have done, Speaker. We have, we have. Um, we have made the decision, and it's a decision that actually was celebrated by the former Prime Minister during the last election campaign, as if he had done it himself, to close the coal-fired plants. There is a cost to that, but there is an enormous benefit, and I think everyone here understands the benefit of improved health from closing those, uh, those coal-fired plants, not to mention what it does to the province. But we are helping families, Speaker, remo removing the debt retirement charge, a legacy tax from when, it, uh, when Harris was in government Answer. two years earlier than planned, saving the average family $70 a month on their hydro bills. As I mentioned earlier, Thank you. we are Thank you. Supplementary. Prices, rates are going up 25% already. They've gone up 25% between last winter and this winter, regardless of what your income is, Speaker. It's hitting everyone. Everyone's bills are going up. Ontario families are worried that the selling off of Hydro One is going to mean the bills go even higher. And the government has tabled legislation that could stop independent consumer groups from fighting for lower rates at the OAB. The government is giving another leg up to well-connected Liberal friends, but making life more expensive for families paying the bills. Will this acting Premier tell Ontarians just how much more it's going to cost people to heat their homes? because of the sell-off of Hydro One. Uh, speaker, let me just continue with some of the programs that are in place now. And the Ontario Electricity Support Program, I really do want to take this opportunity to encourage all MPPs to uh, inform their constituents of this, Speaker. It will save low to modest income families an average of $360 a year. The discount will be applied directly to their hydro bill. In addition, we have the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, saving individuals up to $993 dollars a year and up to 1131 for seniors the low income energy assistant program provides emergency financial support of up to $600 for families and indiv individuals having trouble paying their bills the save on energy program home assistant programs helps consumers manage energy costs by providing energy efficiency assessments and of course the northern ontario energy credit for yes, low to middle income families Order. In Ontario, saving individuals $143 a year, $221 for. Thank you. Final supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. You know, many times this Liberal government has claimed that hydro rates are out of their hands, but they are enacting new legislation that could stop consumer groups from taking their cases to the Ontario Energy Board to fight for fairer rates. Speaker. The new private sector owners of Hydro One can apply for hydro rate increases all they want, and there's no protection for consumers. Here in Ontario, Speaker, will this acting premier tell Ontarians why this government is muzzling independent voices who are trying to stand up for the people of Ontario, who are trying to stand up for lower rates? That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be very clear: Hydro One does not have the power to set rates. That continues to rest with the independent. Ontario Energy Board, this is the open and transparent of the OEB, that's how they engage. Furthermore, the government has introduced legislation to strengthen and enhance OEB's powers, even further to protect ratepayers, increase accountability, and improve transparency. And Mr. Speaker, here's some examples. In 2012, Hydro One asked for a rate increase. They received a 3% reduction of their capital request. Then in 2011, the OEPG also applied for a rate increase, and they were denied the request and lowered those rates. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the Supreme Court of Canada Excuse me. Second time, uh, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Finish, please. The Supreme Court of Canada recently reaffirmed the right of the OEB to ensure consumers pay just and reasonable rates for electricity. Yes, we sir. are in a competitive market, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. My, my next question is for the acting premier. But you know. The OEB might be getting stronger, but consumer advocates are getting weaker because of what this government is doing, Speaker. That's what's happening with the legislation he referenced. Can the acting premier explain why the Liberal government won't rule out even more asset sales? Thank you. Speaker, um, I, I do uh, I acknowledge that the uh, leader of the third party has been asking about this, and, and uh, you know, we've been very transparent about, about our uh, determination to broaden the ownership of Hydro One so we can generate revenue to pay for important uh, infrastructure investments, including in her home community of Hamilton, Speaker. So we, uh, uh, we do have assets. We are optimizing the value of those assets. We have real estate that we don't need to own, Speaker. Uh, we have GM shares that we, uh, we have sold now, Speaker, and we are broadening the ownership of Hydro One. Thank you, Supplementary. Speaker, I certainly didn't hear a clear and transparent answer to my first question. The Liberals are obviously not prepared to rule out selling off more of our public assets. That means selling more money-making, revenue-generating assets is on the table. Will this acting Premier tell Ontarians exactly what they, the Liberals of Ontario, are getting ready to put on the auction block next? Uh, speaker, we have been very open. We have been transparent. This plan has been was in our uh, 2014 budget, our fall economic statement, our 2015 budget, our platform, Speaker. But and we have said we're looking at the LCBO head office. We are looking at Hydro One. We are looking at OPG's head office building, as well as Seton Lands and Lakeview Lands and that we're not looking at LCBO. We are not looking at OPG. We are not looking at any of those assets, Speaker. We will not be selling Niagara Falls power stations. We will not be selling Darlington or Pickering Nuclear, uh, uh, amongst others. But what we will be investing in, Speaker, is the infrastructure that this province needs, and we're determined to do that. We will make the tough decisions so that we can build the infrastructure that the people of this province need. And, sir, thank you. Final supplement. Well, Speaker, in October of 2014, the Premier of this province pretty much said the same thing about Hydro One, and look where we are now. Yeah. Hydro One is being sold off. So excuse me if I have a little bit of, um, of uh, lack of trust in what this uh, member has just said. The Liberal sell-off of Hydro One is a mess, Speaker. The FAO says that the sale uh, will only raise about $1.4 billion for infrastructure, less than half of the $4 billion that the government claims. The government has to count money that it can't spend. The FAO has shown that it will increase the debt. It will, we will be losing, the province of Ontario will be losing half a billion dollars each and every year in revenue. And the government cannot deny that rates are actually going to go through the roof. So, 
When will this Liberal Question. government actually learn from their failure and stop any further sell-off of Hydro One and make a firm commitment to not sell any further revenue-generating assets? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite just made reference to uh, a situation that's not a fact. Uh, she claims that we're only going to get $1.4 billion in capital appreciation of this corporation to reinvest. We've already netted $3 billion of that, Mr. Speaker, wow. going to reinvest in our economy, into new assets, into new revenue and new opportunities. And that's with only 15 percent of broadening ownership. We still own 85 percent, or in this case, actually 84 percent of the company, which is now increasing even greater value and dividends to the province. That's a good thing. It's a good thing because is creating greater wealth, greater opportunities, greater prosperity for all Ontarians. At the same time, it's independently monitored by the OEB to ensure that rates do not skyrocket, Mr. Speaker, because that's the control measures that are put in place. More importantly, dollar for dollar being reinvested into our economy, into new assets for the benefit of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Any questions? The member from the East uh, Thanks, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, the minister claims his plan to hit home buyers with a $10,000 land transfer tax is all about helping municipalities. But if he's paying attention, he knows an increasingly number of mayors are speaking out against this job-killing tax. They know what we know. Yep. that this will make Ontario the most uncompetitive tax jurisdiction in North America to buy a home. That's bad news for a housing sector that creates thousands of jobs and drives important investment in our communities. Speaker, does the minister agree that a municipal land transfer tax will hurt the economy by slowing down home sales? Thank you. You see that, please? Minister, please. Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin my uh, answer by reminding the member opposite that it was the previous PC government that burdened Ontario's 444 municipalities by downloading, without providing any additional resource, $3.2 billion in costs. The uh, member from uh, Simcoe. Uh, Gray, Simcoe Gray, please come to order. Finish, please. We've obviously we've touched a sensitive nerve. We're doing our best to reverse that. We're working hard at that. I just want to say through you, Mr. Speaker, that after every municipal election, we re review the Municipal Election Act. It's no secret that one of the concerns our beleaguered municipalities have is around revenue and the choice as to how, how they will answer. Uh, we're having that discussion with them. We've made no decisions yet, and it's the same Thank answer you. I provided before. The member Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, obviously the uh, minister's spokesperson didn't write his notes today. He told the Mississauga News his boss's tax will result in fewer homes being sold. The minister isn't listening to me when it comes to stopping the imposition of any new municipal land transfer taxes, but maybe he'll listen to the other Steve Clark. Here's what Steve Clark, mayor of Aurelia, told the Barry Advance about this tax. It could potentially hurt economic development in that it would create a disincentive for somebody wanting to buy a house, land, or business. Speaker, Steve Clark is right. <laughs> Steve Clark's out. Will the right. minister take Mayor Clark's advice and support my motion on December 3rd to close the door on this home ownership tax for good? <laughs> Thank you. Minister? I had more nerve than Dick Tracy over there, I think, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Um, let, let me be clear. Ontario is not going to impose any new tax, nor are we going to facilitate a municipal land transfer tax. We believe municipalities are mature and they're democratically elected. They're looking for, they're looking for new revenue tools. We're having that discussion and we'll make a decision based on that. And sh shame on the member opposite, uh, given the history of the PC party, for for ranting, ranting up the uh, rhetoric on this uh, when he, when he knows or ought to know. To the chair, he please. Save the 3.2 billion dollar download. Municipalities would be in much better shape today. Thank you. Good question. A member from Welland. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier and Minister of the Treasury Board. Last week, as part of yet another omnibus budget bill from this government, the so-called progressive Liberals continue to pay back well-connected insiders and friends by releasing corporate giant Alice Don from a long-standing obligation to hire unionized workers province-wide. Strangely, uh, this government is reintroducing a conservative bill. No. that the Premier herself voted against just last year. Oh. Speaker, can the acting Premier tell us specifically who it consulted with on the schedule of this bill and explain to workers in this province why the government has once again introduced the Alice Don bill? Thank you. Thank you, thank you Speaker. And, uh, thank you to the member for this question I, I had anticipated. What we're doing with this legislation is we're providing the authority to the, uh, to the government to make changes, to implement um, a settlement that was reached at by the arbitrator in a process that has been ongoing. It's made its way through the OLRB. It's made its way through the courts. At one point in the past, it appeared we were heading down the road that one side may get everything it wanted and the other side would get nothing at all. With what we're proposing to do with the legislation when it comes forward, with the regulation when it comes forward, is ensure that both sides are treated fairly in this regard. We've had one of the best arbitrators in the country, Speaker, working on this file. He's met with all parties involved with this. He's brought me some recommendations that I will be bringing to the House at a later date Answer. that I think will result, Speaker, in a much fairer settlement than was anticipated before. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I'd say only that 1% is going to be making it okay in this deal. Let's not forget that two separate appeal courts have upheld the 60-year agreement, and now this government is legislating. The problem is, Speaker, it favors one party. That party happens to be a major donor of the Liberal Party. Never mind the Labour Relations Board, never mind the two courts of appeal, never mind the court of public opinion. It begs the question, who really is in charge in Ontario? Will this progressive premier explain why she's gifting legislation to a major corporate donor that would further erode the rights to collective bargaining in this province? Thank you, and thank you once again to the speaker, uh, to the uh, to the honourable member for that question. Speaker, at every possible opportunity, I personally and the members of my staff and the Ministry of Labour attempted to faci um, facilitate a settlement that all parties to could agree to. The arbitrator sat down with the groups uh, over a weekend. They were able to uh, hash out a deal that was agreed to by the parties in the room. They took it out for ratification, Speaker. The one group was able to get it ratified, the other one was not. At the end of this, we called them back together again. We asked them to sit down, see if they could work out a deal, because I knew I was dealing with people, I think, that wanted the best, that did want to achieve a settlement. Despite the best efforts, we were unable to reach a ratified deal within the room. But, Speaker, the arbitrator has reported back to me. He's asked me that when I make a decision to bring in the Thank regulation, sir that I be directed by the settlement that was reached within that room, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Um, Minister, many young people speak, of, in my writing of York Southwestern, speak about the challenges they face in preparing for the labour market. I often hear that they lack the necessary skills and training that they need to find and keep good jobs. This is especially the case for young people who face multiple barriers to employment resulting from some combination of uh, challenging life circumstances. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the minister recently announced uh, the launch of a new youth jobs program, Youth Job Connection. Can the minister please inform the members of this house on how this new program will help our most vulnerable youth access the necessary training and employment services to find meaningful jobs. Thank you, Minister of Training, College University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from uh, York Southwest for that question. Mr. Speaker, last month I was proud to announce the launch of Youth Job Connection, a new uh, targeted program that will provide intensive support and training to youth who face the greatest challenge of finding employment. I am proud to say that our government is investing more than $160 million over two years to help over 27,000 youth across the province of Ontario. To 
to access a number of employment and training services. Mr. Speaker, this program will be delivered at more than 130 employment Ontario service locations across the province, and they will have two components, a year-round component which will help youth age 15 to 29, and the summer component that will provide high school students with summer job opportunities as well as part-time work during their school year. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue investing in evidence-based programs to help connect our young people to the job opportunities they need to succeed. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the minister for that answer. All Ontarians, regardless of their background or circumstance, should have access to effective employment and training programs that give them the skills that they need to succeed. It is reassuring that a program like Youth Job Connection will provide much-needed intensive support to help young people access the labour market. I understand this program is part of our government's $250 million reinvestment in Ontario's renewed youth job strategy, which will help support a comprehensive suite of new youth employment programs. Many constituents in my riding of York South Western would like to know more about some of the other innovative employment and training programs that will be made available to young people. Can the minister inform the members of this House on the different programs that will be included in Question. this new suite of youth job programs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely correct. Youth Job Connection is a part of a comprehensive suite of new programs that will more, that will more effectively serve young people across a broader spectrum of needs and the more locations across the province of Ontario. Youth Job Link, which will be launched next spring, Mr. Speaker, is a program that will help youth who face fewer barriers for employment. I am pleased to say that every single service provider across the province of Ontario and belongs to Employment Ontario Network will be invited to deliver Youth Job Link. We are also making an additional of $25 million investments in employment services to help employers provide more on-the-job training and job and the trial job placement for our youth. Answer. Mr. Speaker, young people and employees across the province of Ontario will be better served than ever with more than 30 Government of Ontario programs Thank now you. in place to help youth build skills and to find jobs. Thank you. New question. The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, my speaker is to the Deputy Premier. Ontarians are now being bombarded with a new ad campaign promoting the Liberals' latest energy price shell game. One shell game ends, a new one begins. The Ontario Electricity Support Program is just the most recent version of diversion and confusion when it comes to energy pricing. It is nothing more than rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It pits one energy-poor family against another energy-poor family, and the Liberals draw the battle line. Speaker, the minister must realize that every and the deputy premier must realize that every Ontario family needs hydro relief, real hydro relief, not another liberal shell grain. Relief that can only come from a shift in policy direction, the wrong direction that this government is on. Will the deputy premier stand in her place and announce a real policy change that will bring real Question. relief to Ontario families? Thank you. Deputy premier. Well, speaker. Um I'm, I'm a bit surprised that the member opposite isn't actually standing up and saying, I'm really happy to see the debt retirement charge go, Speaker, because this will be uh, off the hydro bills two years earlier than planned, saving families $70 a year, Speaker. Uh, in addition, we are focusing on the same people that you have brought up in question period, or your party has brought up in question period, those who really are burdened by high electricity bills, Speaker. We know that the lower the income, the higher uh, the 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 higher the burden of that of that bill, and as I said earlier, I really genuinely hope, politics aside, that everyone in this legislature takes the time to make sure their constituents know about the new Ontario Electricity Support Program. Speaker, yes, it is a significant reduction in hydro bills. It is focused on people who have the lowest and moderate income. Speaker, Thank you. it is important that all members. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, they love to talk about a cornucopia of programs, none of which would be needing to exist if they had a proper energy policy. This is just another classic play from the Liberal governing handbook. And now it's a redistribution program so that the minister and the premier can have some nice photo ops. But then when you examine the details, 
It is nothing more than another shell game. Because of the sliding scale of the OESP, many families who need relief will simply not get it. But more importantly is the point that the $30 stipend from the OSP is nothing compared to the hundreds and hundreds of dollars that this government has added to those same people's hydro bills over the years, and the hundreds more that you're going to add each and every year over the next decade. Will the Premier just simply admit that the Ontario, the Ontario Electricity Support Program is more about photo ops and expensive ad campaigns than actually helping low-income electricity consumers? Thank you. Well, Speaker, you know, maybe the member opposite can sniff at $500 a year relief for Ontario families, Speaker, but that's a meaningful that's a meaningful difference for Ontarians. You know, I found it very intriguing during the last federal election campaign when the Prime Minister and the Minister of, uh, of the Environment touted Canada's progress on reducing greenhouse gases by citing the changes we made in Ontario on shutting down those coal-fired plants. We're proud of the decisions that we made to reduce greenhouse gases. We're proud of the decisions we made to uh, improve the quality of our, our air, Speaker. We're proud of the decisions we made to build a reliable energy system. We all remember what it was like under their watch. It's not time to go back, Speaker. We've made investments. Yes, we don't need more blackouts. We've got the kind of electricity system up here. Thank you. New question the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. Municipal electricity utilities currently make payments in lieu of municipal and school taxes to the Ontario government. This money is supposed to help pay down the residual stranded debt left over from the old Ontario Hydro. Under current law, when the residual stranded debt is finally retired, these payments are supposed to go back to the municipalities. But now, now the government has decided to lay a permanent claim to these payments. Bill 144 changes the law so that this money will never flow to municipalities, even after the residual stranded debt is paid. Why is the government keeping the money that is supposed to be going back to municipalities and schools? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so the payment in lieu of taxes that's uh, is being released, as would any other company, be them municipally and or uh, or, or the one uh, Hydro One. Majority of the LDCs are actually owned municipally, and those payments in lieu of taxes continue, uh, notwithstanding the amount that is being received. A proportionate amount goes to residual stranded debt and or stranded debt. And now we also have done billion dollars more going directly to OEFC debt. Mr. Speaker, ultimately, we are sourcing greater valuation from this corporation, enabling us to reinvest in infrastructure and into other programs to provide even greater returns for the people of Ontario, at the same time paying down debt. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. The residual strand of debt is nearly or should be nearly paid off by now, but by selling Hydro One, the government is making this debt bigger and forcing businesses to keep paying $600 million a year in debt retirement charges. And now the government wants to permanently keep money that under current law is supposed to flow to municipalities and schools after the residual stranded debt is paid off. How many more cash grabs will the government sneak into law to replace the money it's giving up by selling off Hydro One? Thank you. Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite likes to cite the FAO, but now he doesn't want to cite the FAO, who says that as a result of this transaction, we're able to source additional funding to pay down debt. And it's undetermined and uncertain what the residual strand of debt will be going forward because it is an uncertain process. We are providing certainty. We're removing the residual, uh, we're removing the debt retirement charge from residences by the end of this year. Furthermore, we're reducing it for all businesses and commercial by the end of uh, April 1st of 2018. And Mr. Speaker, that provides certainty nine months ahead of schedule, regardless of the degree of strand of debt that will still remain. We know that that's important for residences. We know that's important for businesses, and we know it's even more important for us to reinvest those funds into new infrastructure, new assets. That's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, I understand the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services is responsible for providing oversight to Terria, an administrative authority that manages Ontario's new Home Warranty Plan Act. 
As a part of this oversight, the ministry recently announced a review of the Act with object objective of improving consumer protection for new homeowners. I'm excited to see this review progressing because home warranty coverage is a particularly important priority in my riding. Trinity Spadina is a rapidly developing area with new homes built regularly. Modernized legislation could potentially improve the coverage of Ontario, Ontarians receive. The, the Ontario Question. New Home Warranties Plan Act reviews in particularly timely is, as it builds on a series of important steps this government has taken to improve warranty production Thank you. for new homeowners. Can the minister Thank please you. speak to the See you, please. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member uh, from Trinity Spadina for the question for being a champion on this issue. We will continue to work with Terry and to uh, make improvements to the program, but let's talk about the improvements we've made to date under our government. We've developed and expanded a builder's registry that provides consumers with more information. We've doubled the warranty program from $150,000 to $300,000 for consumers. We've launched a new builder education program to ensure builders in Ontario meet the high standards we set, Speaker, and we've removed an industry majority Ontarians board of directors there is now a balance on that board I'm pleased with these steps but understand that further improvements can be made the new Ontario Home Warranty Plan Act is nearly 40 years old and my ministry is committed to an independent review to assess how the legislation can be served I'm pleased that former Associate uh, Chief Justice Douglas Cuttingham is committed to undertaking the review and I look forward Thank to you. commenting more on the supplement supplementary Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his work on this very important issue. Yeah. I've spoken to the minister on a few occasions after my constituents raised the concern Order. about their new home warranty. Many of my constituents were pleased with the announcement of the review led by Justice Cunningham. The purchase of a home is, a great, is the largest investment most homeowners will make in their lifetime. The review will help to ensure the investment is protected. I see great potential in this review, particularly in its commitment to include multi-jurisdictional comparisons and detailed consultation with new homeowners and the public consumer advocacy group, municipal stakeholders, and many other impacted parties. I understand that this important work will take place over an eight-month timeline. I know the minister will have to wait until the completion of the review before making any uh, commitments on his next step. In the meantime, can the minister speak to what he expects this review to focus on and how recommendations Thank will you. help our government work with Terry on strengthening the Thank protection you. program? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and again to the member from Trinity Spadina. We've, uh, as I mentioned, appointed Justice Cunningham to lead the review openly and transparently with broad consultation and engagement from all stakeholders uh, that are concerned about this issue. I've specifically asked that the review focus on several key areas, such as how we can strengthen consumer protection in a number of ways, including warranty coverage levels and duration, as well as dispute, uh, the dispute resolution process and the degree of government involvement in policy changes of Tarion. As well, Speaker, the review Review will focus on accountability and oversight of Tarion and any information disclosure requirements that would bring Tarion more in line with some of our other open government commitments uh, is an objective that we're uh, looking for. While Tarion no longer has an industry majority on its board, we're also going to review board governance and we'll also be uh, reviewing the regulation making authority of the board. I look forward to seeing Justice Cunningham's report and acting on those recommendations, Speaker. Thank you. No question. A member from Kitchener, Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. As the Minister knows, for too many years now, we've seen too many patients forced to travel to Queen's Park to plead with government for life-saving and life-transforming medication and treatment for rare disease. In the last year alone, and today, I brought in families who heart, whose heart-wrenching stories cry out for government's attention. Many going into debt to pay for life-saving treatment government is failing to provide. Speaker, I've launched a website, treatraredisease.ca, where people can share stories and speak to the need for health care support we all deserve. And this morning, I announced my private member's motion calling government to strike an all-party select committee to develop recommendations for funding of rare disease treatment. Will the minister commit today to support my motion for meaningful, long-term solutions for rare disease sufferers here in the province of Ontario? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, 
I applaud the member opposite for his advocacy on behalf of individuals li living in this province with rare diseases. And it, it can be as much as 6 per cent of our population, Mr. Speaker. I think actually as high as 8 per cent of the population that suffers from rare disease. I also want to acknowledge the courage of those that came here, that were invited by the member opposite, that came here today to tell their very difficult stories about how they've struggled uh, with these rare diseases, including the challenge in our health care system of proper diagnosis. But, Mr. Speaker, it's important that uh, the public know that Ontario, in fact, is co-chairing and leading a process nationally across the, the country. We've established a committee nationally specifically to develop a strategy for rare diseases in this country. Ontario is leading that effort. We're co-chairing the process. Yes, sir. We expect, uh, as a result of that process, to be able to have improvements in this province so we can provide the care these people so rightly deserve. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, uh, Speaker, this all-party committee would hear from experts, physicians, drug manufacturers, and most importantly, rare disease patients in a meaningful dialogue <laughs> instead of the press conferences they are forced to hold to get your attention. Minister, I'm sure you agree that patients deserve more than words of understanding from government and a pat on the back when they are at your doorstep and the cameras are on. This all-party committee will review recommendations government has already received and hear from experts to make sure patients suffering from rare diseases are treated fairly in the system. It's my hope that an all-party select committee will unlock that process that has long remained out of reach. Will the minister join me and support my call to strike the select committee into funding and treatment for rare disease in Ontario? Yes or no? Thank you. Well, thank you, and I certainly look forward to the debate uh, on your private member's bill. But it's also important that long before the member opposite had his pre press conference uh, several weeks ago with patients that were suffering from Eros Danlos syndrome, long before that, months before that, we struck a committee in government specifically on EDS, an expert panel where we brought together all the experts across the province. And I made a commitment when he brought his pa those patients to Queen's Park, I made a commitment to them that day that I would invite them to participate in that panel and speak to that panel so the panel would understand their specific circumstances and the challenges that they face. Well, I'm happy to report that two weeks ago I joined those families and those patients in front of the expert panel on EDS so that panel could hear directly from those individuals. It's important that we focus on the patients, and we need all the partners, Mr. Speaker. We need our drug companies. Drug companies like Alexion, which has perhaps the highest Answer. drug in the world, that chooses to sue our federal government instead of working proactively with us so we can deliver those medicines to those who dearly need them. Yeah. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. On Friday, we learned that 84 jobs will be cut in hospitals in Belleville, Trenton, and Prince Edward County as the Liberals chop $11.5 million from those hospitals. It means fewer nurses and health care workers to care for patients in operating rooms, ER, infection control, the women's and children's unit, and rehab. The list goes on, Speaker. When local residents fall sick, they will feel the impact of these Liberal cuts because every one of those workers does an important job. They save lives, Speaker. When will this Liberal government finally decide that patients are the priority and put a full stop? a full moratorium on any more cuts to registered nurses and frontline health care workers in Ontario's hospitals. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I know the, uh, the leader of the third party is referring to a process that was undertaken by the hospital corporation, which uh, uh, involves four different hospitals, uh, the Quinty Healthcare Corporation, uh, and it's an effort for them to uh, move forward in a sustainable fashion with regards to their funding allocation. But uh, and it's true that there are some job losses that will result, and that's always a difficult thing. That what something we try to avoid at every at every step, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and there will be some shifts as well where it's deemed that that particular job description can be adequately, sometimes even better fulfilled by another type of individual, and that results in a shift of the job. But there are also 78 new positions that will be created as a result of these changes. Uh, but I'm working very closely with the Quinty Healthcare Corporation in support of the LIN, looking and working very closely with the LIN, uh, looking, working very uh, closely as well with, uh, with members Thank of the caucus to make sure that we do 
this properly. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, patients know how important nurses and health care workers are. I wish the Premier and the Minister of Health felt the same way. But under the Liberals, more than 625 registered nursing positions have been cut have been cut from Ontario hospitals this year alone, and more cuts are happening every week. Let's think of that another way, Speaker. It means at least two registered nurses have lost their jobs in Ontario hospitals every single day since January 1st under this Premier's orders. Why won't the Liberal government take responsibility for the deep cuts to patient care and order a full stop? right here and now to any further cuts to nurses and frontline hospital workers. Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the, uh, the leader of the third party focuses on the job losses. She doesn't uh, talk about net jobs in terms of the many hundreds of new jobs that are created, including for our nurses across this, this province. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge the hard work of the member from North um Northumberland, Quinty West, when it comes to Quinty, because particularly with the Trenton Hospital, but across that whole region, he's been working very, very hard to make sure that the services that those individuals, those communities deserve, that those services are retained. And in fact, we, we through that process, we've been working where we created a community consultation process. More than 15 members of the local community that that member represents were consulted in terms of their health care needs, what yep. they want to see in their health care uh, corporation and the local community. And we're also going to be undertaking, Mr. Speaker, and this was at the initiative of the member, uh, the member from North yes, Carolina. We're going to be undertaking a feasibility study to see how we can actually strengthen, in the case of Trenton Hospital, its efforts towards a health community hub. Thank you. The question is the member from the Public Health Center. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, one of the most important aspects of what we do, I think, in government, and one of the issues that I hear about the most in my riding in Etobicoke Centre is about education, about providing our young people with access to excellent education. And I know that our Minister of Education works very diligently and hard on that every single day. Now, when the Government of Ontario and the Anishinaabek Nation signed the first Memorandum of Understanding in 2009, it's clear that they made a commitment to ongoing collaboration that would support the establishment of the Anishinaabek Education system. Now, since the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding with the Anishinaabek Nation, I understand that, Minister, that you have met on a regular basis to identify and discuss common educational issues. To further this process, in January 2014, the Anishinaabek and Ontario agreed to enter into discussions on a Master Education Framework Agreement. Minister, can you please tell Question. us what the purpose is of entering into discussions on a Master Education Framework Agreement? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you to the Speaker and thank you to the member for the question on a very important issue for all of us. I be, want to begin by recognizing the long history of First Nations people in Ontario and in particular the history of the Anishinaabek peoples. The development of a Master Education Framework Agreement CERN serves as an outline, almost an index, to the objective scope principles and processes for the negotiation of a proposed Master Education Agreement. And it gives us an opportunity to collaborate and more formalize those uh, partnerships. In fact, the Master Education Agreement, when we get it completed, will formalize the relationship between the Anishinaabe Nation and Ontario. The agreement also confirms that Answer. we will work collaboratively uh, with the Anishinaabe people so that there's better cooperation between their schools and Ontario schools, which is actually where most of the Anishinaabe Thank students you. attend. Thank you, Minister. Last Thursday, I understand, Minister, that you visited with the Anishinaabe First Nations in Sault Ste. Marie and successfully signed the Master Education Framework Agreement, which I think is fair to say is a historic event. Uh, to my mind, it is evidence of your commitment and the ongoing commitment of our government and the Anishinaabe First Nations to negotiate the terms of a new agreement in order to support First Nations students' education across the province. I'm pleased to know that First Nations students uh, will have better access to education in Ontario and work toward closing the gap in Ontario. Minister, can you please tell this House what the successful Master Education Framework Agreement will mean going forward? Thank you. 
Yes, Minister thank Ripsky. you. And it was indeed a very uh, moving and exciting occasion. There, there were chiefs from all over Ontario who were there to sign the Master Education Framework Agreement. Everybody who was there agreed that this was truly an historic occasion, which gives us an opportunity to collaborate. As I said, if we are going to ensure that our Anishinaabeg students succeed, we must collaborate. Some of the students are in First Nations schools, the majority are in Ontario schools, and what the, uh, what the Master Education Agreement will lead to when it's fully completed is the ability to support students who are transitioning from one to another. It will enable us to share professional development. It will enable us to yes, further, uh, further uh, expand on the agreements that we have between school boards and the relationship between school Thank boards. You. In First Nations. The question the member from Chattanooga, uh, Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. No, Bargaining talks between the province and correctional officers and staff continued over the weekend without results. There is a cost that comes from failing to reach an agreement. During one weekend this month, correctional officers didn't sign up for voluntary overtime. As a result, the province is said to have paid its managers to be on call all weekend at a cost of about $600,000. In May, we learned that the province had spent millions of dollars to prepare for strikes months before negotiations ever began. Speaker, how much money has the province spent to date due to the government's failure to secure a deal with correction staff over a year of negotiation. Question. Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the member opposite uh, for the question. I'm a bit uh, uh, puzzled by the question because I, I take it he wants to intervene in a collective bargaining process, Speaker, that is taking place right now. I'm sure he will be the first one to counsel me not to engage in, in collective bargaining in the floor of the legislature. Speaker, we should respect uh, the, the process that is ongoing. Uh, both sides are working hard. We are very proud, Speaker, that we were able to reach uh, uh, an uh, agreement which was ratified uh, with uh, OPSU on the, on the unified and on the central table, and the corrections table continues to, to work hard. In the meantime, Speaker, we take the health and safety of, inmate, of our inmates and our staff very seriously, and we'll continue to make sure uh, that our correctional facilities are, yes, are safe at all times and services are being provided uh, to the inmates um, uh, through uh, appropriate thank you. staff. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, again, I, I would encourage the government to be continue to bargain in good faith, something that we don't believe is happening. Unfortunately, years of liberal mismanagement has led to crisis in corrections. This has significantly impact, impacted the relationship between correctional staff and the province. Staff have made numerous complaints about dangerous conditions and facilities and have raised the alarm that our correctional facilities are understaffed. In return, correctional officers have been ignored. Even worse, some of them have been instructed by the government to stay quiet. Ontario's correctional officers and staff feel disrespected by this government. Speaker, when will your ministry, Minister, when will your Mr. ministry show Ontario's correctional, parole, and probational officers the respect that they deserve? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I think, Speaker, the question is a, is a, is a serious question. It is an important question that has been that has been asked, and I want to I want to give a, a serious response to the the member opposite and and all members. Uh, Speaker, we take our responsibility in terms of our correctional staff very very seriously. We want to make sure that they are prop properly trained and they are properly staffed because our correctional workers, Speaker, are the front line when it comes to providing uh, appropriate services around rehabilitation and reintegration uh, for the offenders who are, are in our care 
care and custody. And that is why, Speaker, we've been working very hard since 2013 in, in, in an accelerated fashion, rehiring of correctional officers and probation and parole officers. In fact, speakers, we have hired almost 500 new correctional Thank officers uh, in our, in our, uh, in our uh, institutions, and we continue to engage in robust hiring as well. In fact, there's Thank about you. 100 correctional officers being trained at the Corrections College as Thank we you. speak, Speaker. New question, the member from Kitchener and Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, last week, a member of the Liberal Caucus, the MPP for Kitchener Centre, publicly admitted that the Liberals' current plan for Kitchener-Waterloo GO trains is inadequate. She knows, just like the people of Kitchener-Waterloo, that our government that your government promised two-way all-day GO trains to Kitchener in five years just 18 months ago. In April this year, Premier Wynne backtracked. We won't see the first GO train from Toronto to Kitchener arrive in the morning until 2025 at the earliest. Whoa. Speaker, that's just not good enough. The people of Kitchener-Waterloo know what's at stake. Uh, and actually, last year, uh, the, the predecessor, Minister Murray, said, "Go train services Order. that runs every 15 minutes between Waterloo Region and Toronto within five years." That's what the former Minister of Transportation said to the people of Kitchener-Waterloo. Oh. My question, though, is today's minister. Question. Uh, it's a simple one. When can the people of Kitchener-Waterloo expect more than one-way go trains between Kitchener and Toronto? Five years, ten years, or longer? Thank you, Minister of Transportation. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Speaker, my only regret is that I won't have a chance to have a second friendly question like I just received from the member from Kitchener. I, I want to begin answering, Speaker, by paying tribute to the member from Kitchener Centre and the Government Caucus and to the member from Cambridge because of their advocacy, Speaker, not just their advocacy, but their real understanding of what's required when you need to make the tough decisions to fund important, crucial infrastructure. Speaker, perhaps that's the kind of question that that member can ask her leader, who just days ago, Speaker, brought forward a motion and, in debate on that motion, neglected to tell anybody in her own caucus exactly how she, the leader of the NDP, would fund transportation infrastructure. And more importantly, Speaker, the leader of the NDP neglected to tell her own caucus members which one of their projects that they're so desirous of she would cancel if she had the chance, Speaker. Answer. On this side of the House, we understand the importance of spending $31.5 billion over the next 10 years to move the province forward, to move Kitchener forward, and to build Ontario up. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You say it, please. You say it, please. Order. The member from Chatham Kent, Essex, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Legislative Assembly today the Assyrian Youth Group, a group of college and university students from across the GTA. Welcome to Queen's Park. From the Tropical Lake Shore, our part of our pleasure to welcome from the town of Mimico in Etobicoke Lakeshore, the Grade 5 class from John English School with their teacher, Mr. Samatopoulos. We have a deferred vote on the motion to third reading of Bill 9, an act to amend the Environmental Protection Act to require the, sensation, the cessation of coal use uh, to generate electricity at uh, generation facilities. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
I'll be finished routine proceeding shortly. All members, please take their seats. Tuesday, November the 17th, 2015, Mr. Murray moved third reading of Bill 9. All those in favor, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berard Nettie. Mr. Berard Nettie. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmer. Ms. Darmer. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Neal. Mr. Neal. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Arno. Mr. Arno. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabusky. Mr. Yakabusky. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. We're doing climate change as we speak. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fight. Ms. Fight. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. They constantly Rachel not be how to do it. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 86 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, was the election was in the Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. It is not. Uh, it, it is. It is. It is not the process to interfere with a vote. I will not interfere with a vote, but if anyone ever uses unparliamentary language, I would offer them an opportunity to withdraw on their own. There are no. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. Thank you very much. There are no deferred votes. This house stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.